Good evening and welcome to the Four Lakes Church of Christ in Madison, Wisconsin. We're glad to have you with us tonight for our Wednesday evening Bible study. We are studying Exodus chapter 19 tonight, so I want to invite you to be finding a Bible and turning with me to Exodus chapter 19. It is Thanksgiving Eve right at this very moment, and so happy pre-Thanksgiving, I suppose, to everybody. Hope you have a good day tomorrow and enjoy being with family, and remember to uh, thank God for our blessings. But we're studying the book of Exodus, so Exodus 19 is where we'll be in just a bit, so let's be turning there. And as you're getting to Exodus chapter 19, I want to encourage you that if you have any questions, any comments about tonight's class, you can certainly make those on the, the YouTube channel. Uh, if you have something that we need to be praying about as a congregation, if there's some way we can help or encourage you, we want to invite you to get in touch. Send a message to info at fourlakeschurch.org. You can call or send a text to me also at 608-224-0274. But again, tonight we are back to the book of Exodus. So the people have left Egypt following the ten plagues. They have crossed over the Red Sea on dry ground. And God has miraculously provided both food and water. They've had a victory over the Amalekites. And last week we saw Moses get some very good advice from his father-in-law Jethro, who basically encouraged him to delegate. Of course, Moses was judging all the people every day. And Jethro basically says, this is not good. You can't keep this up. You need to spread this out a little bit. And so as a result of that good advice, Moses divides the people into some subgroups and he appoints leaders over those groups. And then only the big cases come to Moses, allowing him to really focus on leading the people and really teaching them the law of God. And that brings us to what comes next. As soon as he frees up that time in his schedule, this is what brings us to Exodus chapter 19, verses 1 through 6. So let's look at the first paragraph tonight. Exodus chapter 19, verses 1 through 6. In the third month after the sons of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that very day, they came into the wilderness of Sinai. When they set out from Rephidim, they came to the wilderness of Sinai and camped in the wilderness, and there Israel camped in front of the mountain. Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the sons of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the sons of Israel. We are now entering the third month after they've left Egypt, and the people are now entering into the wilderness of Sinai. And so they're making progress. They are slowly going in the right direction, but they've now come to the base of Mount Sinai itself. And this mountain is truly in the middle of nowhere. This is a completely unpopulated area. This is in the wilderness, and they are camping. I think most of you know that I love camping. One of the benefits of camping is that you get to be in nature, but you also get to be alone. I think a lot of us, most of us, I think, need some alone time every now and then. But these people are camping alongside two to three million of their closest friends and family. So they're in the middle of nowhere, but they're not exactly alone at this point. They're alone as a nation, uh, but certainly there are many people together, but they're out here in this deserted area. And as we've already learned, providing food and water can be a challenge for a group this size. But I'm sure they would have, uh, would have other challenges as well. I mean, food and water would be the obvious challenges. But think about sanitation. Uh, think about other public health issues, how to deal with contagious diseases, how to deal with various illnesses, and how to deal with conflicts between the people and so on. But here they are, and so God is ready to communicate to the group as a whole. Moses approaches the mountain, and notice God has something of a preview of the message. He starts by introducing himself. You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians. And of course, throughout the Old Testament, uh, God will continue to identify himself as the God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. This was a unique event in world history. No other uh, nation had experienced anything quite like this. And in the process, God pictures his rescue of the people as bringing them out on eagles' wings. And obviously, looking back on it, we've got the history here, so he's not speaking literally. But this is the way that it seemed. It was an impossible rescue. It was as if God came in and swooped in and and picked them up in a miraculous way. He saved this completely unarmed people from one of the most powerful nations on the face of the earth at that time. It was as if God brought them out on eagle's wings. So uh, there's certainly a figure of speech being used here. 
starting in verse 5 then, God has a proposal. And this is the basis of the covenant. Often when a king would conquer another nation, he would propose terms of peace in the form of a covenant. If you do this for me, then I, for my part, I will not kill every single one of you people. And not only that, but I'll even take care of you and provide for you. So that's the way the covenant would go down in many ancient uh, Near Eastern societies. And this covenant is somewhat similar to that in that God sets the terms. And then the people have a choice as to whether they accept those terms. So they're not really setting terms on their own, are they? God is the one who comes in. This is not a negotiation between two equally powerful parties. But it is very much a lopsided agreement. And so God comes in and basically says, this is the way it's going to be. And the question is, do you accept the terms? So here's the old covenant in a nutshell. If you obey me, you will be my people. And the implication is that God will take care of them, that God will protect them as his nation. And obviously this covenant is conditional. This is not an unconditional covenant. There are conditions to it. Because if the people do not obey God, then they would not be God's chosen people. They would not be under God's protection. He would not take care of them as he otherwise would. Well, in the following chapters, God will elaborate on the conditions to this covenant. He's demanding obedience, but he hasn't really given them every little detail quite yet. So this is the big picture. He started already with the Sabbath instructions a few chapters ago, uh, but he's about to reveal quite a bit more information in the very near future as to the exact terms of this covenant. The other part of this is that if the people obey, God would make them a kingdom of priests. He would make them a holy nation. In other words, if they obey God, God would make them unique and God would make them different. God would set them apart from the world. That's what it means to be holy, to be set apart for a special purpose. And by the way, I hope that this idea of being made a kingdom and priest is at least somewhat familiar to us. I hope that it is because it's repeated in the New Testament. We're going to see a lot of repetition between the Old and the New. But over in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, Peter is addressing Christians. And he says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. For you once were not a people, but now you are the people of God, you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. That's in the New Covenant. So I hope we see this as being parallel. Today, we as Christians, we are God's kingdom. We are God's holy nation. So let's continue then tonight with Exodus chapter 19, verses 7 through 9. This is the next paragraph. Exodus 19, verses 7 through 9. So Moses came and called the elders of the people and set before them all these words which the Lord had commanded him. All the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken we will do. And Moses brought back the words of the people to the Lord. The Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will come to you in a thick cloud, so that the people may hear when I speak with you, and may also believe in you forever. Then Moses told the words of the people to the Lord. Over in verse 7, Moses takes the terms of the covenant to the people, at least the introductory offer, and the people agree. Everything that the Lord has spoken, we will do. We will obey. These terms are acceptable to us. So they don't even have all the details yet. They don't even have all the fine print quite yet, but they are agreeable to the big picture. Whatever God wants them to do, they'll do it. And that's a pretty bold commitment at this point, isn't it? Uh, to not really understand. It's like signing a document, buying a house without reading the 30 pages of fine print that comes next. But they really don't have any other options at this point. As I said before, this is a very lopsided agreement, and God has all of the power in this covenant. So Moses then takes the response back to God. And I just want us to notice here that Moses is continuing to serve as a go-between. Moses is interceding here. God is not speaking directly to the people quite yet, but God is speaking to Moses. Moses speaks to the people. The people speak to Moses. And then Moses comes back to God with their answer. And it may not be too significant yet, but I think, kind of in my opinion, God seems to be setting up this idea of an intercessor, uh, a go-between, a priest, kind of preparing us for the arrival of Jesus, who obviously would be the ultimate intercessor. And we have the beginnings of that here with Moses being the go-between between God and the people. But once God hears that the people are agreeable to this covenant, the Lord explains to Moses uh, that he'll be communicating to Moses in a thick cloud. And God is doing this to continue sol uh, solidifying Moses' place as a leader of the people, giving him some leadership credibility. 
And I know we've discussed this before, that God could have provided the water uh, directly. He could have uh, done a lot of things directly, but he chose to do it through Moses to give uh, Moses kind of some more uh, weight, maybe in the eyes of the people, to make him more worth following. So uh, he explains this, uh, Moses does, explaining it to the people that God would be speaking through this thick cloud. So let's continue then with Exodus 19, verses 10 through 15, the next paragraph. Exodus 19, verses 10 through 15. The Lord also said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their garments, and let them be ready for the third day. For on the third day the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. You shall set bounds for the people all around, saying, Beware that you do not go up on the mountain or touch the border of it. Whoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death. No hand shall touch him, but he shall surely be stoned or shot through. Whether beast or man, he shall not live. When the ram's horn sounds a long blast, they shall come up to the mountain. So Moses went down from the mountain to the people and consecrated the people, and they washed their garments. He said to the people, Be ready for the third day. Do not go near a woman. Starting in verse 10, God tells Moses to have the people prepare. They are to consecrate themselves over the next couple days. To consecrate is something, uh, is to set something aside for some special reason, to make it holy. And so they are to make themselves holy. And notice the primary way they do this is by washing their garments. They are to be clean. And remember, this would have been a huge deal for so many people to do out in the middle of nowhere in the wilderness. For two to three million people to suddenly wash all of their garments at once over a two-day period. That would have been huge. Um, by the way, can we think of a parallel to the washing of garments in the New Testament? In what sense do we wash our garments today? Not literally, uh, but I, I think I would see a parallel in baptism. Uh, Paul says in Galatians 3.27, For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves in, with Christ. So when we're baptized, we put on Christ, just like we might put on a fresh set of clothing or a new garment. And certainly we have a reference in Revelation to people having their robes washed in the blood of the Lamb. So maybe a similar uh, reference there. I think I would see that as somewhat parallel, a little bit of foreshadowing going on here. Well, in addition to washing their clothing, God tells Moses to put up barriers around the mountain. In my mind, I'm thinking of the uh, tape and uh, the barricades that we might put around a construction site or a, a, a crime scene, something the police might do to protect people. And the reason for the barriers is to keep people from touching the mountain, because touching the mountain would result in uh, the death penalty. As I understand it, the Law of Moses uh, really didn't have any provisions for prison, as I remember it. I don't think they had like this traveling prison in the wilderness. I mean, either you had to pay a fine, you had to offer a sacrifice, or you had to be stoned to death. There really was no... Uh, in between. There was no 20 years to life in prison. They couldn't do that. And so there was the death penalty when they were traveling here. They couldn't imprison people for uh, years and years. In verse 13, though, notice that when they carry out the death penalty, they are to be careful not to touch the person who's being killed. So they can't run up to them and choke them or uh, hit them. Uh, but instead, they are to stone the person or they are to shoot him through with an arrow. As I see this, they are to treat that person almost as if they are contaminated, almost like they are toxic, like a hazardous waste situation. They are to die, but you can't touch them while they're dying because they have touched something that they're not supposed to touch. And so uh, you don't want to get that on you. And that applies both to people and animals who might touch the mountain despite the warning. Uh, they'll be called on to approach the mountain, at least come close to it, when they hear the blast from the ram's horn. So Moses comes down from the mountain to explain this. They wash their garments as they've been instructed, and he reminds them to get ready. As far as we know, God didn't explain this, but I want us to notice that Moses adds here, don't go near a woman. So it's kind of interesting. He throws that in there. We don't see that from God in this passage. Um, but these three days then, they were, pe they were to be different. This was a special situation. They were to focus <clears throat> all of their energy, all of their attention on what was about to happen on the third day. And we have several interesting references to third days in the Bible, don't we? We've got Jonah in the belly of the big fish. We've got Jesus in the tomb. A number of things happen on the third day. So let's continue with Exodus 19, verses 16 and 17. Just a little short paragraph here. Exodus 19, verses 16 and 17. So it came about on the third day when it was morning that there were thunder and lightning flashes <clears throat> and a thick cloud upon the mountain and a very loud trumpet sound so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. 
And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. So basically, on the third day, everything happens just as Moses had predicted. In the morning, the mountain is surrounded by thunder and lightning and this thick cloud. And when the trumpet sounds, the people are terrified, but Moses brings them out of the camp to meet God at the foot of the mountain. I don't know how many of you have had a close encounter with lightning. Uh, the closest encounter I've had with lightning was riding my bike back from the post office to our house on the southwest side of Madison. I was on Gilbert um, down there by, uh, by the school. There's an elementary school and a Toki Middle School right there. So I was heading south on Gilbert about to cross over on uh, across uh, Raymond Road. And a thunderstorm came up out of nowhere just very quickly, thunder all over the place. And as I was crossing uh, Raymond Road on my bike, all of a sudden I felt my heart kind of flutter a little bit. And all the hair on my arms stood straight up, felt tingly. And absolutely terrified. I know I, I did the wrong thing now, but I, I didn't get off my bike. I just kept pedaling. I pedaled as fast as I could. And I pedaled and I pedaled, <laughs> terrified for my life. And finally, I got to Hegel Elementary School under the water tower on the southwest side of town. And I dumped my bike and I just dove inside the front door of that school. And I uh, probably looked like a, a terrifying creature coming in there. Uh, who knows how they reacted to that. But uh, life or death situation, I dove inside the school for a few minutes until that passed over. But normally, I'm just saying, we get away from lightning, we're scared of it. And here it is. Uh, this mountain is surrounded by thunder and lightning and this dark cloud, and Moses is inviting them to it. Although there are these barriers saying, do not cross, so they are not to actually touch the mountain. They are meeting God at the base of it. Okay, let's continue on and uh, conclude tonight with Exodus 19, verses 18 through 25. Exodus 19, 18 through 25. Now Mount Sinai was all in smoke, because the Lord descended upon it in fire. And its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain sh uh, quaked violently. When the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him with thunder. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, Go down, warn the people, so that they do not break through to the Lord to gaze, that many of them and many of them perish. Also let the priests who come near to the Lord consecrate themselves, or else the Lord will break out against them. Moses said to the Lord, The people cannot come up to Mount Sinai, for you warned us, saying, Set bounds about the mountain and consecrate it. The Lord said to him, Go down and come up again, you and Aaron with you, but do not let the priest and the people break through to come up to the Lord, or he will break forth upon them. So Moses went down to the people and told them. Well, as the people are assembled around the mountain, the Lord descends on the mountain in fire. Uh, the smoke ascends like the smoke of a furnace. I'm thinking of something like a, like a foundry, you know, a, just a massive blast furnace. And the entire mountain shakes or quakes violently, so there's an earthquake happening. We've got the trumpet getting louder and louder. Moses speaks. God answers with this reminder. And, and as I see this, Moses says, well, I already told him not to come. And God says, do it again. Like, give them one more warning. That's the way I see what's going on here. So Moses warns them again. And uh, in verse 22, the priests are to take some leading role by consecrating themselves before the approach, uh, before they approach the mountain. Uh, but only Moses and Aaron are invited and allowed to pass through these barricades, and uh, anyone else will be killed. Uh, kind of a spoiler alert here, but all of this prepares us for the Ten Commandments, and that's what's happening next. That's like the next verse. So that's where we'll be next week. If the Lord wills, we will come back to the Ten Commandments. Uh, before we close tonight, I just wanted to share at least two pictures concerning the possibilities for Mount Sinai. I believe there are two major theories on this, and uh, this is one of those locations. You know, one of the problems is we don't have a sign that says Mount Sinai uh, from 1450 B.C. Uh, nothing like that has survived. A lot of change has taken place in the world over there politically, and so different people have been in charge of this group, of this place, uh, this piece of land. But uh, this is one of the leading theories as to uh, what Mount Sinai was or where it was located, or that this is actually it, according to many people. And uh, both are, are fairly similar as to terrain. So I'm kind of sharing this one kind of to show how remote it is. I think you can kind of see some maybe shepherds and people. This was taken maybe in the 1800s, so this uh, picture goes way back. Uh, but it's actually pretty intimidating, isn't it? If we could imagine this mountain being surrounded by thunder and lightning and a thick cloud and and uh, the furnace and uh, the smoke and the fire ascending. And, and also thinking about this from Moses' point of view. 
he he goes up the mountain and God says, go back down and warn him. Really? <laughs> you know, I, I just, I just climbed. I already made it up here to the, no, he didn't say that. But uh, I mean, what a, what a job this is. This is a serious thing uh, to climb up this mountain. And we can hardly imagine two to three million people gathered around the base of this mountain. It would have been a huge event. And uh, this next one, I believe this is the other possible location for Mount Sinai. Uh, this is a more modern picture, obviously. This one has some people in the foreground, kind of to give it a sense of scale. Uh, but I thought you might appreciate taking a look at these. We don't often get to uh, be on mountains these days, especially here in Wisconsin. Um, here's a quick thought question before we wrap it up tonight. If this is, in fact, Mount Sinai, um, how is it that these people are able to touch it without dying? I don't know if it's maybe worth thinking about that. But I think we understand that the mountain was only holy when God was on it. You know, that's what made the mountain holy. Uh, the mountain was not inherently holy. You know, the place itself was not holy. Uh, but the place was holy when God was there. And I would kind of compare that to God speaking to Moses through the burning bush. Remember? Because God was there, that ground was holy. It was holy only because God was in that place. And so Moses had to take off his sandals because he was standing on holy ground. So maybe we have a reminder here, I think, to uh, be careful how we talk. Uh, especially about some of those lands that we read about in the Bible. I know even today, many people may refer to Israel as being the holy land. Uh, but we as God's people, I believe we need to realize that really it isn't. It is not the holy land today. The, the land itself is not holy or special. And so I try to refer to the Bible lands instead of the holy lands. That's just a personal preference. If you refer to the holy lands, I'm not going to get mad or get offended or... Uh, you know, do something terrible to you. But uh, those places that we read about in Scripture, I would simply refer to those as the Bible lands. And uh, in reality, the land on either side of the Jordan River these days is no more holy than the land on each side of the Ohara River right here in the city of Madison. Uh, the place itself is not holy. The, the Mount Sinai was only holy uh, when God was actually there. Okay, well, that brings us to the end of Exodus chapter 19. We've learned a lesson tonight concerning the importance of God's people being consecrated or set apart before approaching God to worship. So we need to be careful, though, that we don't apply this in a way that uh, was never intended. Uh, after all, this was for the Jews. We are not traveling through the wilderness. So if anybody tries to tell us that we need to wash our clothing before coming to worship based on this passage, uh, let's be careful with that. Uh, otherwise, we'll need to make sure that we don't come near a woman for three days before worship. You know, some of these things, if you just take them to their logical conclusion, it gets pretty bizarre. Uh, I'm kind of thinking of that time back in Genesis when Joseph was in prison. Remember when they came to bring Joseph out of the dungeon to Pharaoh? And the text tells us that he shaved himself and he changed his clothing. And some today have taken that and they've said, well, see, we've got to wear the best that we have when we go to church because Joseph cleaned himself up before he went to see Pharaoh. And if he did that for Pharaoh, then we need to do the same thing before we approach God in worship. There is so much wrong with that way of thinking. But my big concern is that part about shaving. All right, that's just a terrible thing to think that you'd have to shave before coming to worship like Joseph did before seeing Pharaoh. I'm, anyway, I'm just saying we need to be careful uh, how we apply some of these Old Testament passages today. I think generally speaking, though, I think we do see the, uh, the people of God uh, approaching him with a healthy dose of respect. Uh, how that respect is shown would depend on what covenant we're living under. So they prepare themselves, and I think we may prepare ourselves obviously differently today than they did back then. But the principle is the same. We are to be very careful when we approach God in worship, and certainly careful to approach God on his terms and not ours. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight. We're glad that you were with us. And again, if you have any questions, any comments about tonight's class, if there's some way we can help, something we can do to encourage you, if there's something we need to be praying about, get in touch. Send me an email, info at fourlakeschurch.org. You can also send a text or give me a call, 608-224-0274. We would love to hear from you. As we close tonight, let's all go to God in prayer together. Our Father in heaven, you are the one and only, all-powerful and awesome God. And tonight we pray for a greater appreciation of who you really are. We're thankful that you have invited us into your presence in the name of your only Son. And we're thankful for the confidence that we now have when approaching your throne in prayer. We come to you tonight, Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen.